want to put up the slide? Oh, okay. We are here, and I will start with this. You know, this is my first time as a host of one of these webinars, so uh, hopefully I won't be too technically challenged here. Welcome, folks, in. We're so glad you could make it. My name is Kalechi Bozo. We have Paul Simmons who's hosting us today. We're gonna to give it a few more minutes to allow folks to come in. Paul, is there any way to make the slide deck bigger or do you want me to try to share it on my end? Um, well, let me see. Yeah, present mode, yeah. Uh, full screen or? Mm -hmm. oh. That's big. Sure. Yeah, that's great. We can see it now. Okay. Welcome in folks. This is Californians Against Prop 1, a deep dive into involuntary commitment and its implications. We're gonna just give it a few more minutes for folks who are arriving. But if you, you know, we just want to say thank you for being here today and welcome in. Oh, there we go. I couldn't see who was here, but I see we've got over 40 here. So good. Yeah, that's what I was going to do, Sharon. So I'm going to try to do that. See if that works. Aha! That well works. Well done, Sharon. <laughs> no, well done to you, Paul. Oh, no. All right, maybe we'll give it one more minute and we'll go ahead and get started. That sounds good. Does that sound okay? Thanks again for joining us today. Um, this is a Zoom webinar, so we will be presenting shortly, but you'll see there's an area for questions um, as we start to present. Um, we will also have time at the end for Q&A, so feel free to add questions along the way. Thanks, Kalachi. Welcome. I'm good with her being the boss because, like I said, I've never actually hosted a the webinar. I've always done just the regular Zoom meetings, so uh, I'll just suffer. And hopefully, you guys, <laughs> no, you're great. Hopefully, you're... hopefully, you guys won't suffer too much with me. So the first question already is in the chat, which was from Patty. Will you be recording this meeting? Yes, we will be recording yes. this meeting. So we're currently recording. Um, so we should be able to send out a recording at the end uh, along with some resources when we're done. Paul, do you wanna go ahead and get us kicked off and introduce yourself and start? I think I, think I, I think it might be that time. It is, it is. I, I always like, to have everybody here, but you never know how many people are actually going to show up that are registered. So we're around 50 people. So that's that's a good uh, critical mass, so to speak. So anyway, I'm Paul Simmons. Um, I am on the uh, kind of the part of the leadership team for the campaign against Prop 1, California's Against Prop 1. I'm also the co-founder of the Depression and Bipolar Support Alliance of California. So I've been in the, in, the, in the space of mental health for some time. And you see other people's pictures there who are all gonna be speaking at some point. So uh, we'll, we'll do those introductions as we go along. Um, let's see. I, oh, it says chat is disabled on her screen. Okay. Hi, Andrea. Hmm. Fletcher, do you know how to enable chat on? 
actually for webinar, I don't. Um, a lot of times we don't have chat, but feel free to add in questions. That's the way we can really kind of go back and forth with you all. Yeah, okay. I'm gonna check just real quickly before I go on. Um, aha, okay. So I think I have fixed the chat. Attendees can now chat with hosts and panelists and panelists can, I guess, do whatever they want. <laughs> so, Within reason. <laughs> very good. Okay, can, can people hear me now? Okay, any? Okay, good. Alrighty, so we will get started and let's see. There we go. So time to grab our suitcase and open it up and look at all the stuff that we don't want anybody to see. And one of the things we don't want anybody to see, or one of the things that the governor doesn't want anybody to see is really how complex and, and how a lot of the aspects of Proposition 1 um, roll out. So what I'm going to do is to just give a really brief summary of what Prop 1 is. Um, it has two different uh, pieces. One is uh, changing the Mental Health Services Act, and the other is a bond issue that's going to be... Um, put there for six and a half billion dollars, give or take. So Prop 1 would amend the MHSA, which is the Mental Health Services Act. Now that was Prop 63. Uh, for those of you who are in the mental health space uh, 20 years ago, it was uh, passed by the voters, put on the ballot by signatures, and, uh, and it basically was a millionaire's tax. So anyone who makes more than a million dollars a year gets taxed an extra 1%. Uh, in, in the California taxes, and that goes into a fund, which is called the Mental Health Services Fund. And it currently pre funds prevention, early intervention, and other services for people that are either mild to moderate in terms of their mental health issues or at risk or moving into a serious mental health issue or SMI. Um, now, the current, the current MHSA, as I said, raises a 1% tax in California. And it allocates revenue to counties for funding different mental health services and programs. So how it works is it's all collected basically through the, I guess, Franchise Tax Board or some special fund, and it goes into this fund. And, it, and at the end of each year, once, uh, <clears throat> once all that money has come in, then they determine by a formula where that money is going to go. What county is going to get a billion dollars of it? What county is going to get a dollar 380 of it? Um, basically, it's based, it's based primarily on population, of course. So obviously, Los Angeles County, San Francisco County, San Diego County get a lot of money. Uh, Mono, Inyo, you know, some of the really tiny counties don't get a whole lot. But per capita, they, they get a relatively even amount of money. And it gives them to that so that they can put together programs, which, is, which are put on and developed locally. Uh, and sometimes they're shared between counties, et cetera. But the primary focus is prevention and early intervention services. So this is really important because this is one of the most important things that is being changed or is being proposed to be changed by Proposition 1. So we'll get back to that in a, sec in a second. Adult and children systems of care are included in the M current MHSA or Prop 63, uh, supporting individuals with severe and emotional disturb uh, disturbances. In addition to, and we'll get to this later, some, uh, some funding for substance use disorder, uh, patients with substance use disorder, and then services for homeless individuals offering mental health support alongside of helping them to become housed. So you'll see a lot, you'll see some of this stuff is going to be referenced by the Prop 1. So the real changes are that it renames the act to the Behavioral Self Services Act. That's not a big deal, really, in a sense, except it is rather um, meaningful in the sense of the overall picture. Um, about probably five, ten years ago, all the mental health agencies in, in you know in the government and and in a lot of states, um, they started calling themselves behavioral health because that includes substance use disorder. So it includes like opioid epidemic treatments and, and such like such as such as that. And what this will do is it'll expand the scope to include substance use disorder, which I just mentioned, 
but now it's going to be available to people with just substance use disorder. The previous, the current MHSA uh, funds services for people with substance use disorder as part of their mental health treatment. This would take a bunch of money from that fund and put it into a fund just for substance use disorder. It requires counties to spend 30% of uh, the funding on housing related services. They're calling it housing interventions. And um, essentially that's not housing per se that the money's gonna go to, but um, interventions to supposedly, I'm not sure how effective it'll be, but um, supposedly to help people get into a programs where they can gain supportive housing. And that's where it goes into the bond, which is supposed to build some of that stuff. Okay, it increases state oversight, and by oversight, basically um, $150, $180 million a year are going to go up to the state agency, the Department of Healthcare Services, to provide what they're calling oversight and accountability. Now, there's already a, an organization called the Mental Health Services Oversight and Accountability Commission. Um, they will remain, uh, they've been doing the oversight and accountability previously, but they will remain but more or less will then be answerable to the Department of Healthcare Services um, and they will have the bulk of the control in terms of actual power. And then the $6.4 billion bond, which is gonna fund the construction of new, new treatment beds and supportive housing units, specifically for people with uh, severe behavioral health needs. And of course, behavioral meaning not just mental health. So the, the bond originally was written uh, to provide housing and to build housing for uh, veterans who, have, uh, who are homeless, who have severe mental illness, uh, who have different issues and to try to help them. But when the governor put forth this re renaming and repurposing of the Mental Health Services Act, it kind of got combined with that. And the statements that are being made are that this is to help people get home, get housing. And some of this money will go for actual housing units, but the vast majority is going to go to basically create new treatment centers, basically hospital beds for people that um, primarily the homeless, but um, other people who are in that position. This is really centered around the homeless issue. Uh, the, the governor is, uh, is framing this as basically a solution to the homeless problem. Okay, so this will this proposition would reduce the amount of funding that goes to cover mental health services. And this is to the tune of about a billion dollars a year. Less is than, uh, than is currently going for mental health services. And I mentioned that some of the money is going for the substance use without the mental health services. Some of it's going to the state for that oversight. And some of it is uh, going for the housing interventions. So here's, these are some of the consequences that, that we see. There's going to be reduced services because they're cutting a billion dollars out of services. That's not hard or mental health services. So the, the mental health services that are currently being funded by the Mental Health Services Act are going to see some fairly drastic cuts. Um, there are going to be a lot of programs cut. The Prop 1 does not indicate what's going to be cut. Uh, but what it is going to do is going to basically shrink the pie of available funding for the people that are currently giving these services. And for them to gain this funding is going to be a lot more difficult. And there are going to be programs cut. Um, the local programs, the locally developed programs uh, that are done with community-based organizations, et cetera, are going to be most likely to be cut. So funding cuts may force mental health programs, sorry, something's in the way there, to reduce the scope. Um, and the biggest fear, I think, is that the organizations and the programs that are doing specialized programs for specific populations like children, adolescents, adolescents, veterans, people of color, LGBTQ. So the, the, the programs that are being, that are really focusing on a specific population, really drilling down to see what they really need. These are the programs that we see as being most at risk. 
Uh, there will, with fewer resources, of course, we won't be able to spend as much on each patient because we're, so we're going to get a decreased quality of care. Money's not everything, but uh, it does take money to provide quality care. So uh, we already have some of these issues. Uh, we have rushed appointments. I, I'm with Kaiser myself and other people with Kaiser probably uh, recognize that, the, that Kaiser, like other programs, uh, you can wait quite a while in order to get the care and then it's years rushed through. And there will be increased burden on other systems. So if people can't get the mental health care that they require. 57. Pardon? I'm not sure what happened. Just keep going, okay. Paul. <laughs> okay. I wasn't sure if it was one of you or somebody just got unmuted. Okay. Um, so if, if they can't access the regular um, outpatient and community-based services, uh, prevention or intervention, they're gonna end up turning to the emergency room and the criminal justice system leading to increased costs. And this is just a basic pie chart. It shows uh, where the money's going today and where it would basically go under, under Prop 1. Um, Non-FSP community services and supports and prevention and early intervention and intervention and innovations are the the things that are primarily locally based and, and that they're being changed a lot. If you look at the uh, this 38% goes to 33%, but it also includes the early intervention innovation. So there's no money that's specifically going to be designated for intervention or innovations or early interventions. It's called it's sort of in a great big pie that was at, let's see, this is 57, 60, 62% of it is now going down to 33%. That's pretty significant. That's half the money when it comes right down to it. Uh, full service partnerships, that goes down a little bit, but uh, those that's kind of a tried and true system for wraparound services so that people who need care do continue, get all the care they need. So that kind of harkens back to the fact that people with mental health uh, treatment under the MHSA uh, also got treatment for substance use, even though that wasn't considered a an actual uh, mental health issue. So the key the key issues there are um, key issues there are innovations housing, and then this five percent that's what's going up to the Department of DHCS or Department of Healthcare Service DHCS, and they will. Um, basically be getting 150, 180 million dollars a year out of this pie that used to go to services is now going up to the state. There's already that much money going up to the to a state agency that is that was created just for the purpose of overseeing and and uh, this particular fund and holding them accountable. Okay, so that's the basics of what it is. Um, I'm not going to get too much into um, I guess arguments about uh, you know what's good and bad at the moment, but we'll get to some of those as they relate to some of the stories. So, I'd like to turn this over now to Sharon. Sharon, can you unmute? You can. Good. Now sure. I get to mute. So, <laughs> Thank you. Do you want me to jump right in? Jump right in. Okay. So my name is Sharon Sabota. I'm a journalist. I report for East Bay Express, KPFA, and a number of other publications. Um. A uh, trusted um, acquaintance and friend of mine who is involved in the no on Prop 1 side had said, hey, do you know much about this issue? Let Why don't you dig into it? So I, I, I jumped in in July, not knowing. And I like on paper, like many people, I thought, OK, conceptually, this makes sense. Right. And I think what I what I learned <laughs> Um, from the folks who are on the side of yes, as I've dug in, is that um, it only makes sense if you look at it just at the very surface level. And if you don't look at it, if you're talking to the folks who are on the ground doing harm reduction work um, and interacting with people who've been impacted, you start to get a different lens and you see that um, a lot of stakeholders were not at the table at all during this. Um, rather than telling you about, so I'll just say that I've been talking to harm reduction specialists, people who are on the streets do, like doing nursing, um, housing advocates, um, 
people with direct lived experience, and then I don't write about this in, or talk about it in my journalism work, but I'm the daughter of somebody who, um, with lived experience, who at times experienced homelessness, who had bipolar or schizoaffective disorder. Um, so I definitely had a personal interest in, in digging in and uh, talking to people on all sides of the issue. And so I'm just going to highlight a little bit of one family's story. Um, I came to know a really amazing woman named Julia Ford. Julia is a woman who um, experienced trauma in her lifetime, um, had some definitely a collection of adverse childhood experiences in talking with her. She thinks that perhaps her mother might have had some mental health challenges and there wasn't a way to get support. She mentions like there was just stigma. It was very taboo for people who were black and poor specifically, which were her identities to reach out. And her mother was a single mother of six. Um, so she ends up with her own set of challenges does develop um, a dependence, like has a professional job as a hairstylist, then she ends up with a dependency issue and lives in an abandoned school bus. Um, and eventually was getting some encouragement from folks, but she used to see commercials for the Healthy Baby Project. And then when she was in her third trimester of pregnancy with her daughter, Majita, who's here, who I'm gonna introduce to you in just a minute, um, she went into treatment on her own, stayed there for a year, um, and she'll talk about that, and uh, Majita will talk on her mother's behalf, um, but I came to know Julia, who at first thought, oh, maybe, maybe SB 326 isn't so bad, because it allows me, people like me, to get support. Then she said, hey, Sharon, by the way, my mom is conserved by the state of California, and I need to figure out how to, would you like to come and interview her? So I went with. And then we started to look at the interconnectedness of all these issues. So um, Gaynelle Hamilton is her mother and you'll get to hear more about this family story in a minute, but um, she's considered by the state of California and the intergenerational trauma that comes along with this, um, the number of people in this particular family who have experienced housing insecurity, poverty, incarceration, um, and then this is just like um, intergenerational incarceration. So now um, Julia, Julia would love to have care, be able to care for her mother. It's very difficult in her case to reserve the conservatorship. So Julia comes to Contra Costa County to another portion of the county to care for an elderly white woman. Well, her mother is conserved and it's very difficult for her to get out. And her diagnosis is um, she has bipolar disorder. Um, and so I'm going to allow, like, turn it over to her daughter to share a little bit more about the family story, but I just wanted to sort of share the weight of the in injustice of that. Um, part of the reason that Julia is not here today is her own husband is dealing with, um, some pretty major health issues and is, um, getting treatment. So there's some we can just see all kinds of systems coming together, right? We can see mass incarceration or like the, the, the systemic impact of incarceration and the way that that might look different. Maybe somebody's incarcerated in a hospital because they're in a locked facility at a, against their will when maybe a relative might be able. Um, there, there's a feeling by some folks that it's infantilizing, that there's um, one of the harm reduction specialists that I interviewed, Maurice, um, Maurice Bird, who does direct service work with people um, in encampments who might be looking for services. He says that when he finds people that are ready to go into treatment at like TAP, um, treatment access program, and he can they'll call and say, I'm motivated. I wanna get treatment today. They'll say, call back tomorrow, call back next week. Um, and so the concerning part is that it sounds like there's not going to be more effort put into bolstering those types of programs, but, um, but it sounds like involuntary um, access points might be the way to go. And, and so it seems to be taking away agency. Um, and so that's my, uh, that is kind of where I've landed as a journalist who's been digging into this, who's reflecting back on spending a lot of childhood in different psychiatric facilities visiting my father. Um, so I don't wanna to take too much time here, but I do want to, is this an appropriate time to go ahead and welcome um, Majita Wesley to the conversation? 
I'm going to just assume that that's a yes. So a yes. Yes. Uh, can you unmute and uh, jump in and share a little bit more of your family story and your own? Welcome. Thank you. Yeah, I think you did a good job of explaining my mom and grandmother's story. But yeah, I think a big part of Prop 1 that we take issue with is the portion that does take away the, the agency of so many people. And um, like Sharon said, my grandmother's in a conservatorship where we're not able to get care of her. And um, we see the impact of that. But also, I'm formerly homeless myself. Um, so I was homeless when I was in college. Um, as she said, my mom was homeless and had um, substance issues when she was pregnant with me. Um, and so we have plenty of experience there. But uh, we just, yeah, we take issue with Prop 1 just for the um, the piece of... Uh, taking taking the agency away from people assuming that um the solution is you know um the treatment centers and taking the money away from the local governments that already contribute to these issues but yeah if you have questions that are more directed i'm i'm able to speak to that majita can i ask you a question about what it's like to not be able to care for like how has this impacted your life and your family's life the conservatorship yeah, I mean, it's impacted us greatly because all of our ability to take care of my grandmother is um, has been taken away from us. So we don't have that ability uh, to really make the decisions that are in the best of her interest. We have someone who we don't really know. We don't have a relationship with making very important decisions for her life and really for our family's life without um, any input. Thank you. And I think the other thing that you brought up a couple of times with that agency is really important. Can you tell me for folks who think, you know, people who have lived experience or have been unhoused don't, don't deserve rights. Um, could you speak a little bit to the importance of, of agency and, and recovery? Yeah, for sure. So I know in my mom's story, my mom's recovery was made possible because she wanted recovery. She made the decision to go and get treatment. She made the decision to, and I know it's getting dark over here, so I have to turn the light on, but um, she made the decision to go and seek treatment. And that was when she was able to finally recover is when she was making the active decision to go and do it and not when someone was forcing her to do so. Um, and I think that's a huge portion of the, the solution that isn't being solved when we are uh, conserving people or forcing people to get treatment and not allowing them to make that active decision for themselves. Thanks. And I think the last question might be, um, and feel free after that to ask a question before we kind of move on is what would you tell someone who's on the fence of prop one right now who thinks, wow, it sounds really good. Maybe that was just your situation. Um, what would you tell that person who's still kind of trying to figure out what they want to do when it comes time to vote? Yeah, I would tell them to look more into prop one. I know for me, I've listened to a bunch of podcasts. Oh, it's really dark over here. Um, I've listened to a bunch of podcasts about Prop 1, really to listen to the pros and the cons, because um, when Sharon first reached out, um, and I spoke with her because my mom had already been in contact with her, um, I needed to educate myself on the prop. And, you know, from the surface, it sounds good. Um, I don't think anyone on the surface would say like no to housing the homeless or no to getting people treatment. But once you start learning more about the proposition and how it's going to be taking funds away from the local governments who a lot of the, the podcasts and the experts on the issues that I've listened to have said that the local governments that are engaging in um, the assistance are doing a great job. Um, so I think that's what I would say is just do more research. I think Sharon has a question for you as we wrap up on your story. Well, yeah. I'm going to just leave with one last thing. Um, so one thing that people are saying is like, we're going to fix mental health issues. And then um, and then housing is just going to be resolved. That's kind of the oversimplified way. And one thing that I learned from talking with Majida is um, 
how like her lived experience of living in the shelter while going to college kind of uh, dismantled that a little bit. Um, and I wondered if you could just share like how you saw the process of housing insecurity impact mental health as opposed to the opposite way. Yeah, so I think one common misconception that people have about the houseless population is that they're homeless because they're mentally ill or they're homeless because they they're using substances. When I was in a homeless shelter in Hollywood and I was at the Covenant House in Hollywood, um, I seen very often where people would come in and they weren't using anything, at least from what I could see. And we were with them for uh, extended periods of time, sleeping in shared rooms with them and everything. And they weren't dealing with any mental illness that could be seen at least. Um, but within a matter of weeks to months of being in the facility and having to, because in the facility we were in, every morning you'd have to leave and you weren't able to come back in there until the evening. So people had maybe eight, to 10 hours a day where they had nowhere to go. They just were outside. I was, thankfully I was in college and I was working 50 hours a week. So I was never there during that period of time. But a lot of the people that were there were finding substances because they they had all of this free time that they were outside of the shelter. And that was leading to mental illness. So we would, I would see people come in day one and for whatever reason, whether they aged out of the foster care system or um, they became homeless some other kind of way, it would go from them being homeless to them now being substance users to them now visually, you can see that there is some mental challenge or something that is combined with the substance use. So I would see that progression versus I think the the assumption of homeless people is that they're dealing with substance or mental illness first, and then now they're homeless. Najita, thank you so much for sharing your insight, sharing your story. Sharon, thank you for coming on and introducing us. Um, I think we probably have Latanya up to share her story up next, but I just want to say thank you. That perspective of un understanding that lived experience from someone who's been unhoused and who's been around folks who've been unhoused um, is really, really pivotal. Any last thoughts? No. Perfect. Thank you, Majida. Um, my name is Latanya Richard. I am a certified Medi-Cal peer support specialist. I am founder of Peer Voices of Merced County, the Shane Street Project. Um, I have a lot of lived experience in a lot of different areas. I have been in, unhoused because of my mother's uh, financial issues. I have been addicted to opioids because of doctors over prescribing me medication. And for the last 20 years, I have been misdiagnosed as bipolar and schizophrenia. Um, I was given all kinds of medications and deemed, uh, what was they say, treatment resistant. And even though I tried to fight for myself and say, I have never had any of these symptoms, I don't understand. Yes, you are, you're sick, you need to take these treatments. And I got four rounds of ECT that destroyed my cognitive function the way it used to be, my memory. Um, and the last round of ECT, because I was an opioid user, my doctor used that as a reason to conserve until 5150 me because after the ECT, my blood pressure dropped and I almost died. And so when I woke up, he said, well, you took pain medicine before the surgery. I know I didn't. Yes, you did. And before I could even say anything, he had police come while I was still in the hospital gown and handcuff me to a wheelchair and take me from the, emer the surgical part of the hospital up to the mental health part, and I was locked in a small room. I had on, they forced me into a, they forced me into the the thing, and um, I fought. I fought because when I know that something is wrong and it is unjust, I'm going to fight for myself, and now I use 
all of that crap to fight for others. I, I it's it's there the systems fail all of us, and it's not for housing. It's not for homeless. It, Christina, you have a question. I saw a hand, Christina. We were gonna hold the question. Okay, so okay, yeah, yeah. Feel free to add it to the Q and A, okay. Christina. Go ahead. Um, um, I had a really, really rough childhood. Really, really rough childhood, and because of that, I never wanted kids. I, I didn't want children because I didn't want to pass that down. And when I fell in love and decided to have kids, I wanted to be the best mom I could be. And because I was depressed and went to a doctor who I found out later was doing the same thing and misdiagnosing a lot of people, I left an office with, with an appointment that should have just been depression with 12 very strong antipsychotics medications. And people don't realize that black and brown people are misdiagnosed at such a high rate, such a high rate. Nobody really cares. And we're fighting for that. And if you guys are like seriously even doubting that Proposition 1 is a good thing, it, I mean, thinking that it's a good thing, it is not. It is not. Not just the community-based organization, but real lives will be impacted. My children lost out on what could have been a great childhood because of doctors not listening to people, because of racism, medical racism, flat out. It's a shame and we need to change it. And yes, medical racism is very real. Medical racism is very real. I literally still have to take people with me to doctor's appointments because doctors say the meanest, worst crap to me, period. And it gets to a point where you want to give up, but then I realize that other people are going through it and I can't give up because I'm going to fight for the rest of my life to make sure there's equitable care for everybody. And if that you can't give equitable care and you're a politician, you're going to lose office because I will fight for the rest of my life to make sure you never hold political office anywhere ever again. Thank you. Are there any questions? Thank you so much, Latanya. That was really, really, really powerful. Um, I know there are some slides to kind of go with yeah. things. I don't know how to access that because <laughs> Paul has them. Paul, can you uh, read the slides? Yeah, there were some other um, points, but I just want you to see that you're getting some love in the chat, that people are really appreciative of you fighting um, that, you know, folks want want to be part of your story, want to hear more about your story. So I, I wanted to make sure you heard that as well. Okay. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Okay. So that oh, you have the slides 10 bigger, and 11. Yeah, they're really yeah, small. Make it bigger. Yeah. I've got, I've got glasses on, but I don't have. Glasses. I know. I, <laughs> <laughs> mm -mm, I, I can't see that at all. Wow. We give all a few moments just want to ask folks feel free to keep throwing love in the chat support in the okay. chat but also add your questions to the q a we see a lot of them so all right go ahead latanya okay so increase in involuntary treatment prop one comes after several changes to the state's mental health system including the launch of newsom's care court which he's now trying to be nice and call it care act but it's still the same it's still horrible System for people with serious mental illness and dramatic eligibility changes for conservatorship. These changes are expected to result in more people being placed in involuntary treatment. And it's just like a blank warrant. It's a blank warrant. Um, increased involuntary treatment. Proposition 1 does not directly advocate for increased involuntary treatment. However, it does indirectly lead to more involuntary commitments through increased emphasis on involuntary treatment within care court. Increase availability of treatment beds, potentially more court order treatment more feasible, making court order treatment more feasible. Next. Okay. 
The possible rise in involuntary commitments along with the decrease in mental health funding would strain the mental health system and affect the level of care. So the community-based organizations that are currently keeping people stable, they're going to lose a lot of funding and the people that are stable will probably more than likely end up in a mental health crisis, which of course is going to cause people to lose jobs and then of course become unhoused. So the system is just rolling around and cycling to make it worse. Additionally, the financial consequences of this proposition of this proposal could have lasting impacts on the state's budget. It is essential for all of us to grasp the significance of Proposition 1. The possible increase in involuntary commitments, Prop 1, would allow for more involuntary assisted outpatient treatment, which would help ensure people with severe mental illness receive treatments. However, we argue that this could lead to an over-reliance on involuntary measures and infringe on individuals' um, civil liberties instead of addressing long-term housing. This bill would lead to judgment and conservatorship, which means loss of self-determination and civil rights. Uh, decrease in mental health funding, Proposition 1 pr proposes some funding increases for mental health services, but also diverse existing mental health funds to supportive housing. Supporters argue this is necessary to address the root cause of homelessness, but we worry that it will leave existing mental health problem programs underfunded. Um, yeah, this is Kelechi's story. All right, I don't know how to highlight myself, but if someone could put me back up, that'd be great. Mm -hmm. All right. Hi folks, I'm Kelechi Bozo. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you, LaTanya, Jeed, Sharon, and Paul for, for presenting, for sharing your stories. I'm gonna share a quick story, but I also have seen some kind of questions about other forced treatment. Um, so I wanna talk about that. But first, I just wanna ask you to imagine your life trajectory being judged on your lowest point. So maybe it's a day, maybe it's a week, maybe it's months or longer. For me, it would have been the day I tried to kill myself following a sexual assault and I was voluntarily committed. Um, and I just wanna say for folks, part of my story is triggering. Um, I don't do it to shock people. It's to tell you that it's not even shocking in my community of peers. Like when we, when we share our stories, it's like, oh, that happened to you too. So I say this, that when I was involuntary committed, I was treated like a burden, I was told not to let myself get raped again by a nurse. And as a black woman, I always have to think about racism, historical racism, how does that play into my treatment and my care? Um, and at the hospital, what I, what I received instead of peer support or even therapy was chemical restraints. So for folks who don't know what chemical restraints, restraints are, Latanya talked about it. It's when you're overly medicated. So you're just, you have, you're on a cocktail of something and you're, you're on a spaceship and you're gone, right? It's hard to make any decisions. It's hard to be really present. It's hard to really be clear. Um, but it's a, it's a way of basically controlling your body. Um, and I experienced verbal abuse and the treatment modality was really coloring and watching movies, including Silence of the Lamb, which I asked is silence a lamb in a psychiatric ward an appropriate movie choice? I was told I was so high functioning, right? That's another way of showing racism. So I wanna say there was no therapy, there was no dignity, there was no peer support. I didn't have any choices. I was told when to eat. I was told I had a mental illness, that I would never work. I would never get married. I would never amount to anything um, and that I would be a burden on the system. And this is from people who were supposed to be in charge of my care. And so I, I wanna double down and say, my story is not rare, it's not unique. And a lot of people don't know what it's like to have someone make all of your decisions for you. So when you hear things like prop one is going to provide housing and that housing equals hospital beds and institutions, these institutions, this is what I'm talking about. This is what happens in institutions when you're put away. So yes, your family knows where you are, but they don't always know what's happening to you, um, as we heard in Majid's story. And the space to heal wasn't even healing. It was overcrowded. It was chaotic. Um, and then I was just sent away with like no support, no supportive linkages, no community-based programs. So I would say if the current treatment is traumatic, why would we expand something we don't, we know doesn't work? 
And it really took a lot to recover, not only from the trauma of the sexual assault, but actually the trauma of the institutionalization. Like those were the traumas. I added more traumas in being in the system. So I do wanna note that what really helped me were things that like Mental Health Service Act funds, peer support programs, voluntary trauma-informed therapy, um, and a belief that people can and do recover. I think that's also something that's missing from the conversation is that people think we are so broken that we will never heal, but we, we are misdiagnosed, we are forced, and we, don't, we are not introduced to healing a lot of times. So I'm really concerned about the beautiful programs that are going to be cut because they're upstream and they are actually healing centered and healing focused and full of people with lived experience. Um, also, I saw someone put something about care court being voluntary. So I just wanted to quickly say um, that, and you can put the slides up, um, care court begins with an involuntary referral to the court by a family member, a police officer or a government official. Treatment is imposed by a judge and then enforced with sanctions. So those sanctions are hospitalization, we already talked about medication or conservatorship, we've talked about all three. Um, so you'll hear people say that it's voluntary treatment um, and the media covered it as voluntary treatment, but I'm going to tell you all, how can something be voluntary when there are consequences for not following through with your care plan? If someone decides where you live, what medical treatment you have, and if there's anything like non-compliance and you could be forced into a conservatorship, that is not voluntary. Anytime there's a consequence for not doing something, that is not voluntary. So I bring this up to kind of show you the connection between all of these laws that are coming out right now, right? So we just talked about care court, which you know I just shared that. And there's also S SB 43, um, which expanded the definition of grave disability to include substance use as a basis for conservatorship, which will subject more people to involuntary hospitalizations and conservatorships. And so look at this, it's like this three-legged stool where you're seeing that these mental health bills, these policies that are getting passed are actually really, really harmful, but they look on paper like they're something good. But this is a political use of psychiatry. Like, so just to be clear, forcing someone to do something against their will is forced treatment. No matter how pretty the language is, that's one of the reasons I'm against it. So if you are non-compliant, if you are black and brown, if you are unhoused, if you're queer, if you are someone who the system has deems as a danger to themselves, and we are usually on the other side of harsher measures. And this really perpetuates stigma and stigmatize black and brown folks further. Um, so again, I'm just gonna leave it with trying to help someone who's living with a mental health issue by taking their rights away exacerbates the problem. And researchers have even found that forced treatment contributes to quote unquote non-compliance. Um, and I think the last thing on this is it's a strain on the mental health system. We are actually underfunded. The behavioral health system is absolutely underfunded. So to take funding when we're in the middle of a mental health crisis, when the pandemic that is not over for a lot of people with disabilities is still happening, um, and we're still, we're dealing with more like higher suicide rates. We're dealing with like a lot of mental health challenges right now um, to take money away from something to fund forced treatment, not, not a win for us. So Prop 1 includes funding for additional treatment facilities and staff, but it's not going to be enough. And some of the financial consequences, it authorizes $6.4 in bonds, which is going to add to the state's debt and the long-term financial impact, we're not sure what it will be, but opponents argue that the costs outweigh the benefits. So if you're someone who is like, all of these bills sound good, all of this sounds good, think about who's against it, right? People with lived experience are against something that's supposed to help them. That should make you curious. Um, so we can stop the slideshow for a moment. I'm gonna go ahead and actually introduce Someone who has been doing some really important work around this. Um, his name is Rob Wypon. He is a freelance journalist and creative nonfiction writer who writes frequently about the interfaces between psychiatry, civil rights, policing, surveillance, and privacy, and social change. His articles have been nominated for 17 magazine and journalism awards in science, law, business, and community issues. 
and he's the author of the book, Your Consent is Not Quiet, Required, The Rise in Psychiatric Detentions, Forced Treatment, and Abuse of Guardianships. So it's my honor to have Rob join us today and um, welcome him to the stage. Thank you, Kalechi, and uh, thank you, everybody, for those amazing uh, sharing uh, before before me today. Um, yeah, I mean, if you're wondering why and how I got into this issue, aside from the fact that it, it involuntary commitment touched my my family, um, but it's also because I've met so many people over the years who've had these kinds of experiences that we've been hearing about today, and and you know, I, I just compelled me to try to learn more and 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 to write about it. Um, I'm going to put a few uh, things in the chat there now. Uh, just any references today, you can email me or that link would have most of them. And also a link to a talk I'm just going to mention. It's just a, it's a really cool talk about by a psychiatrist of all people, but it's very good about structural causes of homelessness. He's from UCLA, so it was in California focus. And, and solutions like housing first and how to really make that kind of program work. It's a great talk and it's something you can share with others to help educate, I thought, around this. It's not about Prop 1 specifically, but gets into a lot of the key issues. So uh, I'm gonna share, I got some slides here that I wanna share. So I'm going to uh, try to do that now. Where's my uh, screen sharing thing? Um, all right, there. Share. Okay. All right. So that's just my book there. Um, all right. So some of this we've covered. I'll just jump through it uh, quickly. But you know, it's interesting. A lot of people talk about violence in relation to these issues, you know, that somehow everything uh, California has been doing over the last while is going to address violent, mentally ill people. Well, in fact, almost none of it touches on that. Seriously violent people, It's us they're usually committed under what's already called forensic and criminal law, uh, whereas what's really being talked about in all these legal changes are surrounding uh, both voluntary mental health services and, and civil commitment or in, involuntary treatment for people who are, generally speaking, relatively nonviolent and law-abiding. And so that's a, just important context for everything we're talking about today, because often they refer to, oh, people who push somebody into, on um, you know, threw somebody into the subway tracks, and that's the person we're dealing with. No, in no way do any of these laws even kind of get near cases of that kind. They're much more like the kind of cases we've been hearing about tonight, people who are just really struggling and maybe even reach, reaching out for help, and their services are going to be cut back or they're going to be subjected to forced treatment. So what is involuntary civil uh, commitment? Well, it's a lot of this. Uh, whoops, sorry. <laughs> oh, no, sorry about that. Uh, uh, so yeah, I just, uh, they, they can involve any of these kinds of things that people already touched on, you know, police apprehension, short or long-term locked or semi-locked institution, or coercive home visitations. I'm going to talk a bit about that because this is actually a major, major uh, uh, phenomenon in California, even though it's not strictly speaking being done under legal provisions right now. It's being done um, quasi uh, extrajudicial, extrajudicial if you will, uh, security guards, threats, uh, including the pressure to sign in as voluntary, your belongings are taken, you can be subjected to forced stripping, restraints, seclusion, there's monitoring and surveillance, often tranquilizing and sedating drugs that can be injected if you put up any kind of resistance, and electric convulsive shock therapy it can still be done uh, against people's will. So how do people feel about this? Well, the kind of things we've been hearing tonight are not uncommon at all. Like per perceived coercion is the key factor here. There are people sometimes who will say, hey, I was grateful that they, they stopped me from doing something that I might have otherwise done. 
And usually what you find when you delve into those kinds of stories is that they were collaborative experiences. They, the person was treated very respectfully. They were talked about, or are you, do you currently take some kind of medications? Have you ever tried any before? Would you like to? And it's a very respectful, mutually collaborative experience. And in those kind of cases, as you can imagine, it can sometimes turn out okay for somebody and they may be somewhat grateful. But more often, if people put up any kind of resistance saying, I have tried that drug, I didn't like it, or anything like that, they find these experiences very humiliating, traumatizing, terrifying, brutal. These are the kinds of things we hear all the time and appear in, in the scientific literature about this as well, or chemical straight jackets, you know, permanently damaging experiences, and comparisons to prior physical and sexual assaults are terribly really horrifyingly common, we'd have to say, how often people who've been through these kinds of experiences say, this was the same or worse for me to the supposed help that I got. And so what percentages are grateful? It's hardly ever been studied, but there's interestingly one done in the United States where they looked at assisted outpatient treatment, which was forced treatment in the community and found that 72% of the people after a year were still saying, I am not grateful for this experience. And they were getting all kinds of supports as well too. So it's really kind of sad and it really shows you how much people can really hate the coercion generally, but particularly the coerced drugging. So recent California developments, these have been talked about, so they're just highlighted here. The expanded commitment criteria, expanded conservatorships under the care courts. And I want to highlight that there are, there could well be many more full service par partnerships because a lot of the quote unquote housing interventions that are being proposed will be full service partnerships. So it's still kind of up in the air, but it really does seem that there's going to be a lot more of those and that's going to be more relevant in a second. And then there are definitely going to be many more detention centers and what I would call coercive facilities under Prop 1. And this is highly relevant. We're going to get into some of the data. So does California have a shortage of 10,000 beds? This is what the government's been saying. This has been repeated ad nauseum by the media. It's actually written into the legislation. If you want to go look at some of these laws, they'll say, oh, eight to 10,000 beds short. Well, that comes from a RAND study that was recently done. I'm not going to criticize the RAND study per se. It's fairly clear what they did and didn't do. And, you know, it's it's forth, forthcoming. But it's been very <laughs> misrepresented what they actually found and what they didn't find. So yes, since the 1950s, we've got far fewer beds in state psychiatric hospitals, but beds in all sorts of other facilities have gone up, 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 and nothing but up. And the RAND study left out all kinds of beds that they could not really get good numbers for. So that included all psychiatric facilities for children and youth, just not included in their numbers. Supportive housing, group homes, largely not included. Full service partnerships were not included. And this is highly relevant because the numbers we have show that 45,000 up to 80,000 is actually the number I just got today in a back and forth with the government around this. They're not really sure. They don't even have really good numbers on this, but it's somewhere in this ballpark of 40 to 80,000 people. So look at that number right there. If you included those numbers alone, you've got four times as many beds. And by you here you have to say, what is a bed? Well, a bed is not only necessarily a psychiatric hospital. It can be, in, in the case of F FSPs, it may just be an ordinary home where the person is getting psychiatric supports. And that's relevant because that's often what the asylums were in the 1950s. They weren't like these amazing places where people had a grand time, right? So if we're going to make comparisons in what, what is a psychiatric bed then and today, this is all I'm trying to highlight. Like you may have problems with some of these types of situations that people are in. They might be in a motel room or something like that. I'm not saying these are great beds. I'm just saying we should be counting them because people are getting coercively treated in these environments. They're getting mental health services of some kind, and they should at least accounted and accounted for, counted and accounted for when we're kind of talking about what's happening in the system today. And they also didn't count prison units and established treatment programs within prison, which would be tens of thousands more. So why is this relevant? It's because it's showing you that the extent of coercion going on in California today already seems to be so high, much higher than it ever has been in history. That's what it seems to be. And is that the case? 
Um, yeah, we're going to find that out. So right here, we have two times to as many as seven times as, as, as many beds. And here's what the coercive treatment numbers are telling us. So the best numbers we have, 22 states, the, the data here is, again, across the country, it's appalling. And in California, it's particularly appalling um, because there's a, a mirage of it looking good in California, but it's actually not good when you start delving into it. Uh, so we have 22 states. The rates of psychiatric treatment are uh, involuntary psychiatric detentions are increasing at three times population growth over this five year period. Uh, that's 600,000 detentions across the country, which is about 357 per 100,000 people. And that is double or triple or more rates in the UK and most other comparable Western countries with similar mental health care systems. So what this is telling us is, is the United States and Canada, incidentally, as well as is very high as well, are using mental health incarceration as an extension of the police state that is already itself, as we know in America in particular, uh, you know, very, very large uh, police state. And this system is being used as an extension of that. So the numbers in California in particular are up there at the average around 308, except here's an audit was done in San Francisco, and they found that the actual number of emergency psychiatric detentions was nine times higher than the institutions had been reporting to the state officially. So that put it at 1,600 per 100,000, which would be by far the highest rate in the nation, five times the national average. So if that's indicative of what's going on across California, and we don't know because the numbers are just so poorly reported, if that's an indication like, wow, there is a, a real crisis of emergency tensions going on. And then you add the FSPs to that, the full service partnerships, where studies have shown that about 60% of those actually require treatment compliance. So it's not in the law. These people are not necessarily being legally detained or forcibly treated under the law, but they're told essentially, if you if you want this housing, you have to take these drugs. Or if you want these services, you have to take these drugs. Another thing I want to highlight that's going on is we have this picture often that, oh, you know, um, yeah, homeless people are doing all sorts of crazy things. And that's why, uh, you know, the, uh, the police, unfortunately, you know, have to show up and, and take them away. You know, we have this sort of image that's presented to us. Well, it's the exact opposite. An amazing study was done here out of San Francisco where it was about complaint oriented policing. 90% of police homeless interactions initi were initiated by 911 or 311 calls by other people. People, right? So they're basically getting homeless people in trouble for sitting or lying on sidewalks, camping, trespassing, panic. So it wasn't that homeless people were being so disruptive, the police had no choice to show up, but basically neighbors and businesses and other people were constantly calling, trying to either get them help or get them in trouble, one or the other. And so this is that, you know, huge, huge issue. And so another example of that was from Oregon. They actually did a study and they found that in one year, more ho homeless people in Portland were arrested or detained than the federal homelessness count had even found in the city. So that's how aggressive we're being with policing homeless people right now under both mental health laws and criminal laws. And this is manifested now in the Department of Justice has been suing states, finding that in large institutions, tens of thousands of people around the country are being held in these institutions when they don't need to be. But doctors are just saying, well, there's really nowhere else to go. If we let them go, they're going to degenerate. So we can't let them go. We're going to keep them locked up in a psychiatric facility all this time. And so this is a major issue that's been going on now for a decade, where the Department of Justice is suing multiple states at once. They got more in the works all the time. So this is just a huge national trend. So do we have any evidence that any of this helps uh, scientifically? No. So here's just some selected quotes from the peer-reviewed literature. Use of seclusion, physical and chemical restraints are very common, despite a remarkable lack of evidence to support their use. Locked wards, constant monitoring, emergency medications are not supported by evidence or difficult to justify. These are all from scientific studies, often by pro-force of psychiatrists, incidentally. Psychiatric forced medication is a remarkably understudied practice 
involuntary treatment is based on tradition rather than evidence, and there's no evidence for public safety arguments, no reductions in serious violence. And of course, we have all these harms that people have already been talking about, conversely, to counterbalance against that. The most startling being that uh, is suicides after psychiatric hospitalization seem to increase hundredfold or more, 200-fold, 300-fold, even among people who were not suicidal prior to being hospitalized, even among voluntary patients. So I just want to highlight there. So you'd say, well, what is really going on? How is involuntary commitment being used? And it's not only being used against homeless people. And this is just some of the things I explore in the book, all these other kind of social circumstances where uh, uh, psychiatric detentions and, and strong sedating or tranquilizing drugs are being used against people's will. And of course, within that, as others have already highlighted, a lot of prejudices, a lot of biases, all the dominant prejudices in our color, in our in our culture today, are are prominently uh, coming to the fore in a lot of these kinds of situations as well. And this is why, in the wake of the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, they have declared. Uh, psychiatric interventions uh, that are involuntary to be arbitrary detention and torture under the convention. And the World Health Organization recently put out a guide to remove coercion from mental health laws altogether. And so America, and particularly California, is going in the opposite direction now to what the dominant recommendation is really internationally after extensive consultations and scientific research. And there's just that talk I was highlighting. So I already gave you the link and that's my book. So thank you very much. Thank you, Rob. That was great. That's Rob, a lot of stuff. I'm gonna send, oh, Rob, <laughs> I'm going to send you my book and get you to sign it. <laughs> All right. I see Mary Jo has raised her hand. I don't see her though. Mary Jo? She may not be able to unmute unless you can find her. Oh, okay. You know who is here though? Emily is here. All right, Mary Jo, go ahead. Okay, um, I love what we're talking about, but I'm also have a, a mindset of let's live in the solution and not the problem. And I see, I hate to be a pessimist, but I think this is probably going to pass based on the hype that's out there and all of the media hype and everything else. So my first question is, how do we as advocates get at the table as soon as there's a there's a, a time period between passing of the result of the prop and development of the rigs? How do we get our foot in the door during that period of time when they're figuring out how to do it and, and to be at the table. That's number one. Number two, we need to get out into the media, and I'm hoping to do this in San Diego by May, the positive recovery stories. The media needs to know that people with mental illness and lived experience have incredible recovery stories, that we now have a career path, just like SUD and nurses' aides get certified, we get certified. We have a career, and we need to start pushing that out, those stories out into the media that counteract all of the garbage stories that are that are going out. And that's kind of where I'd like to see 
advocacy go after the prop is voted on? Anyway, that's kind of where I'm at. And those are a couple of things that I'm thinking about in terms of solutions once it's passed. Thanks, Mary Jo. That's, and that's, that's really important stuff. I mean, uh, one of our, our biggest frustrations with the last couple of years with the governor and his programs of Care Court, uh, SB 43 and, and now Prop 1, has been the fact that the people that are actually uh, depending on these services, the people who are actually providing support to these people are being left out of the discussions. And unfortunately, when you have a governor who is this, who is this dismissive of the populations that, that are supposed to be being helped, uh, you're not likely to come up with some really good solutions. Um, there's a phrase that we've been using for quite a while, nothing about us without us. Uh, if you're going to make laws relating to mentally, mental illness uh, or, or the homeless issue, ask people who, are, who have diagnosed mental illnesses and ask people who are unhoused and find out where they are coming from, what they actually need. Uh, it's, it's, not, um, it's not very useful if you just sit on high and say, oh, I'm just going to, you know, go to the French laundry and just make my decisions. You know, it's just uh, <laughs> there's a lot there's a big disconnect between this power structure and what's been happening uh, and then and then the people uh, that that are, that are uh, going by the next couple of slides. And, and I want to I want to get uh, there's a lot of Q&A and I want to start getting to the Q&A's as soon as the questions as soon as we can. We've answered a few of them that were fairly um uncomplicated in the actual Q&A window, but I wanted to try to get to those. Um, the next two slides you will be getting, uh, which are basically resources. And um, actually, I might just uh, go ahead and show you. Oh. Yeah, and okay. Emily's here too. So, so these are resources and news stories. Uh, so you'll be getting these, uh, so I won't go through them or anything like that. Um, let's see, it's 641. Let's um, actually let's let's go ahead and get one more story. Uh, Emily is here. Emily has been part of the uh, of the group fighting against Prop One and, and and Care Court and whatnot for quite some time. So I'd like to give her the opportunity to share her story. Now I'm going to see if I can get back to it. <laughs> yeah, I'm here, but I can't turn on my video. Can you hear me? Yeah, we're gonna try to. Yeah, let me stop the shit. There we go. Yeah. Um, we can hear you. We're good. Okay. I still said you cannot start your video because the host has disabled it, but uh, I can definitely share my story audio version. Um, hi, everyone. So my story, I was so glad to be able to do a webinar with Rob in January. And sorry, it's so messy. I mean, so loud over here. Um, I'm still in the airport and just getting back home and um, but you know seven months ago I was basically hospitalized against my will and it was so frustrating because I uh, they this mental health system basically overreacted and put me in the uh, ER my local ER uh, without bringing out a psychiatric mobile crisis team and then I was mistreated in the ER, and I was also mistreated in the Kaiser mental health system. And then after 50 hours, I came back home, and then they gave me a bill for over $3,000. I'm like, oh my goodness, like, how screwed up is this system? It's so absurd. And just being able to meet Rob after my 5150 just made me feel so validated that I too also need Rob to sign my copy of my book. Your consent is not required because it's just the system is so absurd. And Rob knows that I want to write an Imari too. Like uh, I've said, how I, I need to write my own one woman play because this system is so effed up and, and the laws just don't make sense. How can, if the law can allow for people to be uh, psychiatrically put in detention in the hospitals against their will, then why the F 
are they making people pay for it? That makes no sense. And so I'm I ever since I discovered this group, Californians Against Proposition One, I'm and and learning about how other psychiatric survivors are uh, experiencing such terrible things like what I experienced, I'm just like, wow, I have to be part of this team, even though I'm not, you know, we're doing all this work from our hearts as volunteers. And, you know, we, we, I, I believe we have justice on our side because when anyone hears our stories, they must be heard. And the system has to know that this just makes no sense. And, and so, yeah, thank you so much, Rob, for all the investigative journaling, journalist work that you do, Kalechi, you two, all of you, everyone of you on the Cap One team, Californians Against Proposition One, you are my family, because my family, my biological family does not know how to advocate for me. And and I feel like I, I I have gained a new family outside my family through this team. So thank you for all of your hard work from the bottom of my heart. And I can't wait for uh, to hang out with you guys in person. Much love to all of you. And thank you everyone here for being part of this webinar. It means so much to me. Thank you. Thanks, Emily. Love you, Em. Yeah. Adore you. Oh, there she is, finally. <laughs> <laughs> On video. I yeah. love that. Emily does bright green better than anyone else I know. She's amazing. <laughs> and the ironic thing about, you know, the me being 5157 months ago was that I used to be the face of the California mental health movement when it used to be called Each My Matters. And that was that initiative was paid by Proposition 63, the Mental Health Services Act. And so I I was their token. I was their token Asian to tell my recovery inspiration porn, you know, and they didn't even tell me for it. You know? So it's just bizarre how things work and and it's just like, oh great, thank you for you know, betraying me mental health system when I used to promote your mental health system and then I was never psychiatrically put in detention 5150 until seven months ago. I'm like, wow, so this is what Ellen Sachs experienced. This is what other psychiatric survivors experience all across the nation. This <laughs> America needs to do much better. We have Absolutely. to do better. Absolutely. Thanks, Emily. So I'm going to go back to the Q&A. Yes, thank you. Um, I'm going to go back to the Q&A and we're just going to have uh, the panelists jump in as they as they see uh, they have good answers. So the first one thing, first one I see here is, can you talk about why the local programs focused on specific populations are most likely to be cut? I don't think it's the most likely to be cut, but it's one of the more likely is to be cut because they tend to be smaller programs. They're not, they're not doing, um, they're not like large organizations doing full service partnerships and such. They're really focused on, on the smaller things. And so they have, they're smaller and they tend to have uh, less political clout. And, uh, and, and it's gonna be a shark tank with less water and more sharks. I don't like calling my colleagues sharks, but you know what I mean, basically. They're, you're, in a, you're in a place where more people or just as many people are gonna be competing for uh, smaller things. Um, yeah, can I add quickly that a lot of folks who are peer run or local programs are funded through prevention and early intervention dollars. And since that money, which is upstream, um, doesn't require Medi-Cal billing, that that's why a lot of those things are going away. They're taking away innovation, another thing that doesn't require Medi-Cal billing. And innovation and PEI funds usually fund like more like specialty populations in a different way. So that's the other the pieces because where PEI dollars are going. Next question was about the, uh, about, I think it was about four, maybe six years ago, uh, the people of California passed a proposition too, which is called No Place Like Home. And uh, the, and that money was for the housing interventions and housing was coming out of Prop 63 
for the MHSA. So where does that piece of pie go? Does somebody want to take that? I can generally answer it, but I will generally answer it. Um, <laughs> just jump right in. Um, I'm going to try to keep things moving here. Basically, the no place like home piece of the pie is still there. It's, it's not being affected by Prop 1. Um, has it been effective? That's, I supported it wholeheartedly, but I'm a little bit upset that I did because it really hasn't been as effective, nearly as effective as we liked. And I think that's, I think that the, the, when the government tries to do housing programs, it's often extremely inefficient and slow in implementing it. Even if it's a really good idea, sometimes uh, uh, I think, you know, and this is my own general opinion that uh, for the government to do it is going to be incredibly inefficient for the government to support this kind of program can be a lot more efficient. And that's where we we generally need to go uh, for, for the government to support programs that are going to increase the affordability of housing, which is really the biggest problem in our, uh, with, our with our homelessness. Uh, yes, there's a Venn diagram, as I like to say. Some, some of the people who are homeless are mentally ill. Some have drug addiction. Some are immigrants. Some, some just are victims of a family breakup, and they had, don't have one third of the income they used to have. Some lost their job for three months and they were already on the edge living hand to mouth. So um, there are a lot of issues there. But generally speaking, the no place at home hasn't uh, hasn't uh, won't be changing to the best of my knowledge. Um, let's see. What can you what do you think we can do to really shine a light that the unhoused challenges are not only related to serious mental illness? I kind of said something about that, but does anybody have ideas about how we can shine that light? Rob. Rob does. <laughs> of course he does. Now that's one that, just, <laughs> that one quote, doing it. quote drives me crazy. Um, yeah, you know, I hate it because if you even look at the, the survey that was done specifically of homeless populations in California recently, you know, and how it's been spun, the actual details show that uh, it looks like maybe 10 to 16 percent, somewhere around there, qualified as being like having been labeled as, you know, seriously mentally ill. All the other stuff was like these surveys they did around. Have you been feeling anxious or depressed over the last 30 days while you're homeless? Right. And and then and that's the number. It's that second number that gets propagated. It's in the legislation even. Right. And the preamble, 80 percent of unhoused people struggle with mental health conditions or whatever. And that's how the media is replaying. And they just I just I can't stand it. Right. Because, I mean, already just the diagnoses are so dubious to begin with. But when you start compounding them with, you know, these things like mental health conditions uh, like depression, anxiety or whatever. Like, it's just off the rails, right? And so the evidence is there. It's as clear as day. And it's like somehow news media, somehow the legislators, they just they just don't want to really see it, right? They want to spin it the other way because there's an agenda here. There's an agenda of, you know, we want to we want to grapple with this issue in this particular way. And when you talk about agendas, I always refer to Watergate, which is follow the money. And usually those agendas, uh, if you follow the money, you're going to find what people's agendas are, whether it be the hospitals, whether it be the prison guards, whether it be the pharmaceutical companies, et cetera. So, yeah, uh, that and, and these and these political parties get to kind of blame, you know, rampant economic problems and unaffordable housing and low wage rates and lowering lowering welfare rates. Like they want to blame all that on on mentally ill people. Right. That's what's really happening there. Like, because you're seeing both conservative and liberal governments do this across the country, you know, and, and you just can't help but think that that's just it's a great little excuse, right? Uh, and I don't have to grapple with anything seriously suddenly. And I hate that everything gets labeled as mental health when, oh, he shot up the store. Oh, that's mental health. No, he was just pissed because somebody told him no. And you want to say it's mental health. No, everything's not mental health. Some is just entitlement being unhoused, being poor, everything's not mental health. If we keep labeling everything mental health, it discounts the real issues. Mm -hmm. All righty. Um, okay, I'm going to get to one more. And I say Johanna's raised her hand. We'll get to that one next. I'm going to try to jump back and forth. 
This is a really important one, and it's one, and it's something that I've been asked a number of times by reporters, by mental health agencies. But what are the alternatives to Prop One? I'd like to hear people, some of the panelists' ideas of of what are some of the alternatives. Uh, this this attendee said that his friend was killed by police when he was experiencing a mental health crisis, and he had no family support or help, and was one of the millions of people who fell through the cracks. So, so. If what we're doing now is not working, is it working? Is it failing? Is there something we can do differently? In other words, if, if not Prop 1, then what? And I'd like to hear some uh, concepts from our, uh, from our yeah. panelists on this. First, I want to say I'm so sorry for your your loss. And I, I'm so sorry that, that a mental health crisis often ends in fatality. Um, and that's not what anyone needed or deserved. So first, want to say that. The second thing that I put in the chat earlier is that, and I don't know why they're not funded and we haven't funded them, we could have peer respites. We could have a peer respite in every county where someone with lived experience, um, a team of folks would support other folks who are actually in a crisis. Because a lot of times we need a place to be in a crisis where we're not gonna be forcibly treated, where we can de-escalate and, and ground, maybe have like, wellness recovery action planning, whatever it is, group support, peer support, um, but peer respites have been something that have been proven to work and they are not funded because, because of the stigma of people with lived experience. The stigma that we can't actually heal and or support each other. But if we were actually to fund those, they would change. I mean, so many problems would be solved. Um, a lot of problems would be solved. So that's, I've always will put that, that's my number one ask is like funding peer respites. I would say, let's get the police to get uh, at least peer certification or mental health training, um, de-escalation tactics. And honestly, because I'm petty, I would like them to continue like maintain a, get new like certification like every two years and they have to get CEs to know that they're knowing what, de-escalation tactics are cultural competency is and how to help people with mental health training mental health issues because they just go in immediately with they're violent let me do something and that's not the case always yes yeah, stigma equals discriminations exactly yes Emily. So I've been writing in the chat box that I definitely think that, um, well, Rob and I met because of the 988 federal issue. And uh, 988 crisis counselors, there's no standard training that they take. And so I, I think that in the state of California that the 988 crisis counselor should at least be trained in the Medi-Cal peer certified uh, trainings. So that there is some sort of level of like, you know, consistency um, in this entire state of California. Um, I think that should be mandated. Um, we should have peers always involved in psychiatric mobile crisis teams, mental health evaluation units, um, working with the police. And so that it's not so daunting for a person in emotional crises to um to to have so like like how like a peer right a peer i think we all can agree here that peers to a certain extent have the ability to empathize because we've been through an emotional crisis before so why can't we be included in the conversation to be a support to those who are having those emotional crises so um funding those kinds of programs because my 5150 happened around midnight and it's like i keep on asking the board of supervisors where were they where were they where were they? <laughs> why did they not show up for me you know and they did not show up even for um my uncle who who, who died um in in a psychiatric hospital uh just because the er social worker thought oh he should be 5150 and he got transferred into a hospital uh, without telling the family and then he died the next day. It's like, what, what? You know, we, we need to do better. Um, we need to include peers 
um, if this proposition one does not include peers, oh, it, it is going to be a great danger to the peer workforce in mental health. That's very true. And that, and that kind of speaks to the whole issue of uh, this the rhetoric that's being used about letting people die with their rights on. Uh, meaning if we give if we don't violate their constitutional rights, they're going to die. And in fact, as as in that case, you know, they violated his constitutional rights possibly and, and he still died. So um, forced treatment does not eliminate that problem. Um, I'm going to go to a raised hand. I've got Johanna and I just allowed you to unmute, I think. Let's see if it worked. Johanna? Johanna? Sorry if I'm mispronouncing. You can go ahead and unmute. Do you have a question? Ah, there you go. Hello. Hi. I just wanted to know, um, when I, I, I was uh, an ambassador in California, I did a lot of work. Um, and I struck a very good You're breaking up. You're breaking up. And so I can't understand you. There's a lot of background noise. Is there any way for you to put put your question in the chat? I mean, we'd love to hear it, but it's hard to hear you. Thank you. Thanks, Sean. Okay, how about now? Can you hear me better? Yeah. Yes. Yay. Okay, perfect. Yeah, so I just wanted to say that uh, I was working with Access California for quite some time, and we were monitoring this for about four years. And I just started feeling, I've done a lot of advocacy in, in the environmental areas. Um, I don't know if anyone follows the IPCC report, um, but it has to do with climate change. And one of the biggest issues that is occurring right now through the IPCC report is that mental health crisis is gonna increase. Um, due to people losing land, their families, um, you know, with climate change. Um, so with that being said, there's, I found that this, this, um, um, this policy like prop one is really being forced on. I don't know if we're going to be able to stop it. Like, honestly, I feel a little hesitant. Like I've been working on some other advocacy, um, things that have taken over decades and decades, like even before my lifetime, but I still continue to fight um, that are, you know, environmentally are about the environment. Uh, so I, one thing that I started to do was thinking about my own community and how to, how to help it without like having less, um, not being, not, not being impacted so much by care court. So, um, my community, East Los Angeles, has a large immigrant community. So I've been looking at um, different uh, lawyers and people that can speak up when care court comes around. Um, my biggest concern is the children because families will, will be separated once people are put into conservatorship, right? Um, and sorry, I'm like kind of all over the place, but also going back to like care court, care court being taken like, taking four years to just get to this point and no matter how hard we fought it just kept passing um and again like a lot of it was illegal if you look at it you know how it was passed like all these little things um from all these different areas just changing with the with the word um uh gravely disabled is is being um labeled as so i just wanted to know uh, oh yeah, and then there's like all this missing, all this money, right? Follow the money, but I'm wondering, um, like, have we heard anything back of how San Francisco is currently? Like, do we have any stories from people in San Francisco? Like, how are they trying to protect themselves once since Care Court has already rolled out over there? And have we thought about how? We, we can even go to San Francisco and point out, oh, see, this is a flaw here. This is a flaw there. This is what's happening to the community. And think about how we can, you know, because we can, in Los Angeles County, we're not going to implement them until 2026. So I'm wondering, is there anything we can do to, again, lessen the blow when care court comes around? That's a lot. Sorry. Thank you for listening. Yeah, who wants to take that one? 
<laughs> it is a lot. Thanks. I can for start. Yeah. Just just for a piece of it. So, I mean, I think what you're bringing up, you're bringing up a lot of different things, but I think the thing that you brought up is also something that Mary Jo brought up. So you're bringing up, wow, care, care court is going to happen. How is it rolling out now? And Mary Jo brought up, like, if Prop 1 happens, how do we kind of fight? So if the thing we want doesn't happen, happens, how do we actually, you know, come together, fight it? So there's, I mean, there's a lot of different ways and there's a bunch of advocates on this call. But one thing is a lot, all the counties have Mental Health Service Act coordinators. They have Mental Health Service Act planning. They're going to have to like come back to the community if certain things pass. They have care for conversations. They have work groups be at those work groups, join everything, sign up for your county's list of all the different meetings, but specifically ones that are around either Prop 1, we are not assuming it's passing here because we are saying no against it, we're not giving up our fight, and strategically um, really get plugged in to different counties and, you know, kind of what the implementation is. And then, I mean, I think there's a kind of gathering of like minds, right? There's there's lots of peer run organizations. There's a lot of people with lived experience who are talking about, here's what I've done here. Here's other things. It's a lot of informal. So how can we actually gather together to talk about how are things implementing and what are the loopholes? What are the things we need to learn from each other? So I would just kind of say that we could start there. Um, I'm burnt out on all of the things. So I'm not on all these work groups, but there are people who have a lot of energy and who are joining and sharing information. So I think there's an encouragement of, like trying to learn from one another about what's working, what's not working. And then I would talk to harm reduction folks. I would talk to people who are unhoused who really know how to like avoid being detained. Like what are, where can we maybe have a training of like, okay, your rights are going to be taken away. What do we need to know about this? How can you avoid being conserved, right? That's probably another training that hopefully one of our groups could put together. But definitely... Here, here on the whole concept of we can't do this individually by ourselves. We have to do it in coalitions. We have to get together with other people of like mind, or at least semi like mind on 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 specific issues. I mean, there in the coalition against Prop One. I mean, there's uh, I'm going to send out a list of all the people that are against it, and it's not this. It's not just the same people. It's not just civil liber libertarians. It's not just peers. It's not just the anti-tax people. It's not just any of these people, there's a wide coalition and we have to work together to take care of, of what we need. I do, Andy Herman put into the Q&A asking basically, uh, is there any, are, are there any uh, legal challenges gearing up to challenge Prop 1? Uh, I would like, um, I know that for, there's a group called Disability Rights California that's, that's also part of the No on Prop 1 who worked on, on care court and they filed a challenge to the um, Supreme Court, which was rejected, uh, the California Supreme Court, which was rejected. Uh, but um, if you're interested in, in, in legal aspects of that, in terms of particularly where you're talking about gravely disabled or uh, severely mentally ill, um, I do recommend, I mean, I do encourage you to reach out to Disability Rights California. They've got a bunch of lawyers and they, they know their stuff. Uh, they don't necessarily know mental health as well as some of the rest of us do, but they certainly understand and get the legal aspects of uh, what's going on. Um, Andy, I hope that, that helped you a little bit, but uh, yeah, uh, uh, they're, the, they're the group that has the attorneys that most of our groups that are opposing this don't have. And so they've been a, a big support for us uh, in that way. Anyone else real quickly on that before I, it is past seven, but I'm going to stick around. I'm going to stick around at least till 730 to keep going with Q&A. But uh, this was supposed to be an hour and a half. And uh, don't think that you have to stay if you don't want to, but please do. OK, um, then I see Christina had a question in the chat box and she's already got and she also has her hand up. So. Uh, her question was, who determines what's enough when we have <coughs> when we have misleading data? Doesn't the data determine how much funding is needed in each county? And I'd say the data typically with the MHSA, um, as it has been, the money is sent out in the only way they can, which is basically based on a formula. 
I'm not an expert on the formulas they use, but you know it is largely uh, a matter of population and that sort of thing. Uh, Christina, I'm going to go ahead and allow you to talk in case there is something else or something related that you wanted to ask. Christina, go ahead. <coughs> Excuse me. Christina Murphy, I see you there. You've got your hand up. You're unmuted. I can't hear you. Hello, can you hear me? That's better. Thank you. Good up. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for this opportunity. And I just want to say thank you, everyone, sharing their personal story. That is the main impact. That's what matters right there. So thank you, three ladies and everyone else that took their time out. This is what I want to ask. I, I want to know how do we get here? Like, how do we get to this point? Because all year, I know, like, for the last five years, maybe even for the last 10 years, I've been fighting and advocating in the community. And we've had plenty of talks at the table with the funders, uh, Governor Newsom, you know, he, he supported the peer support specialists, uh, you know, and so how do we get here? Because what I'm hearing and at all these different meetings I go to, it's like, hey, um, we're being cut in this area, but we're going to be pu pushing it over to this area. How do we get to a point where we feel like we pull from this area to help this area instead of asking for the MHS 1% 1, 1 to go up to 2%. Like, how come we're not advocating for that? My question, and my question is, is that there's like thousands and thousands of us peer support specialists. Some of us, like me, California State Certified. Some of us are taking like the trainings to get there, but there's a, there's thousands of us that are working, providing great services that, yes, not getting paid livable wages, but we're still providing the service with a happy face, with our hearts, like loving, like with like with our real authentic ways, selves, with our tools. Like, how do we get to that? Because at first it was about let's get everybody trained so that because the clinical services are not really working. So we see that. So now we need the peer support specialists that are in recovery, wellness recovery, to come back and show us clinicians, how do y'all do it? Let's sit at the table together and collaborate with the person to discover their own uh, goals and gifts and help them accomplish them. That's what direction we were going in because I I helped start and run first uh, Sally's Place, first peer respite in Alameda County. So I know it was working. And I know services like that work and everyone in the county and in other counties was excited about it. But now we're at a place where we're talking about, well, the money is going to go to substance abuse and housing. Well, if like, how can you deal with substance abuse and housing without dealing with mental health? And how can you deal with that without dealing with the other parts like education to support, like, the, you know, the 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 five core concepts of having wellness recovery like what, what how can you move the money without discussing asking for more money and we have this accountability part right like i appreciate most of the people on the accountability but we have to be honest there's no accountability in some of these areas and they already got the funding so when we talk about well this money is going to go where it's um, going to come up with new solutions. Well, we've been at the table having these community workshops, these community powwows, where we telling like the people that don't lead the, the 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 podium, like this is what we're needing. We need alternative services. We need someone that's been through what we've been through um, to sit with us and to 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 support us through the journey. Not tell me if I don't do this, then I'm not doing right. Like. You know, and so I want my question again is, you know, and I'm a person that's been voted in by almost 40,000 people uh, in Berkeley when I was on the Berkeley Rent Board and I was on the Police Review Commission and I was on a whole lot of stuff and I'm still on a whole lot of stuff. So I think I have like some privilege to where I get to like have a little bit of passion behind my voice because I just don't understand the talk talks. I feel like we should be uh, having webinars and talk talks mm -hmm. on how to mobilize, like how to get all of us that are well each Maui Matters, all the programs, P P POCC, SHARE, all the programs where people are living in wellness recovery day by day and dealing with life <clears> on <throat> life first. We need to be mobilizing. Where's the funding to get us on the plane, to get us on bus 
trains and automobiles so we can go out with signs and make some noise like that because that's what worked. If Sally was here still, rest in peace, you know, she'd be there like, let's mobilize. I'm Thank you, and I'm sorry if that was long, but I'm not sorry, and so thank you. With love. <laughs> We're not sorry either, Christina. Thank you very much. And, and you know, you're looking at somebody, you're looking at several people that when some of these laws were being passed, particularly the enabling laws for Prop 1, went to the, to the committees and the legislature and said, you know, if you're, if you're going to use some of our money for, uh, for some of these programs, raise the tax. You know, don't, if, if you want us to do more, then give us more money to do it with. And, uh, <clears throat> The governor's office basically just laughed at us. And they they did not respond well, put it that way. And and, and you know the the their, the consultants from the committees came back and said, yeah, it was a non-starter. He's not interested in that. It's a political thing for Newsom, and I don't want to get too much into Newsom bashing, although it is fun. Uh, but uh, <clears throat> it's you know it's a political move. He's this is part of his run for president, and we'll see see how that goes. Um, uh, the, I think the best thing we could do right now to to start improving things is is to hand him a defeat in my March fifth is to is to beat this prop one, uh, spread the word, get everybody you know, get everybody that that you know, and what who they know. Social media is an important thing, but uh, yeah, encourage everyone to vote no on prop one. And I tell people if you don't completely understand all sixty eight pages of it, join the club. There are probably like 10, 10 to 20 people in the state that actually understand every bit of it. It's incredibly complicated. It's incredibly long. And it was done intentionally so, so that they can just run ads and say, we're going to help the veterans. We're going to help the homeless. And they don't have to back it up with any real, real arguments. Um, okay. Uh, Mary Jo, you've got your hand up. I think you've got, I think you're able to talk. <clears throat> Mary Jo? Yeah. Oh, okay. Go ahead. Okay. Um, I wanted to um talk a little bit about care court because San Diego has um implemented it. And one of the things that we found that there weren't as many petitions as we thought there would be, and then the process through the petitions is long. It's you know, you gotta submit it to the court. And then it has to be reviewed, and then the care plan has to be done, and then it has to go back to the judge. Um, and like you say, it is voluntary. Um, but what we've done down here is legal aid has a contract to educate people and protect their uh, their rights. Um, legal aid, the consumer center in San Diego is the um, designated patient rights advocate for all outpatient programs in San Diego. So if you can get through, you know, disability rights and legal aid locally um, and, and those kinds of entities that are already protecting rights, um, you know, and that's another thing that I, I put in the chat is that, you know, who, where is the accountability for patient rights advocates to be able to do the work that the statutes require that they do? So, and then another important piece to pull in are um, patient rights advocates and and the the legal stuff. I know Rob, you're probably you know real familiar and aware with that, but um, that's one of the things that we've done. But I don't know if anybody's got numbers in terms of um, how many petitions there have actually been um, for care courts statewide, because I'm hearing that the numbers are low. Well, I'm kind of pleased that they're low, quite honestly, because I don't think it's a great program. But, um, but yeah, that I mean that that's a good question. We're not really seeing what's, I and mean, we're just beginning to see the type of the tip of the iceberg on on Care Court. And uh, yeah. I don't want to get too far into the weeds on Care Court right now because we're really no, I don't really want to get into it yeah. But I wanted <laughs> to let you know that we had implemented it. Yeah, you can yeah. shut me down now. 
No, I'm not shutting you down. Just thank you. Thank you very much. It is just getting late. Uh, John Vanover, you've got your hand up. Yeah, uh, thank you, Paul. Um, just want to start by saying big thank you to all of you and for all of the other tireless volunteers behind the No on One uh, team. Uh, it's it's really amazing, and we're so grateful for all of you for, for the time you guys have put in. Um, before we wind down, I just wanted to see, given his extensive experience and knowledge, I was wondering if Rob could offer any bit of hope or guidance for the future of our movement beyond Prop 1. Um, just one small thing I want to offer up. I mean, I don't think it is small as people are talking. You know, uh, there are some other states that have specialized mental health uh, trained legal teams. You know the mental health hygiene legal service in New York, for example, and and that can make a difference in these kinds of situations. And I'm thinking, you know, in the future, that's something to start lobbying for. Is just hey, hey, at the very least, because disability disability rights in California, you know, they have such a broad mandate with all, you know basically all disabilities of all kinds under their mandate and umbrella. You know, the, the, that's really, in my experience, all those disability rights groups in every state are really just struggling with with their funding to do what they're supposed to do and all of that. And so I think a specialized service to represent people who are being uh, coerced in different ways in the community. And then that service also can become more broadly knowledgeable about all these laws, because you can see even in the, the government instructions on care courts, for example, they're very contradictory, confusing. You know, I watched an online presentation by a judge to to others, you know, and it, they were lost too. So, so I, I have no no doubt that it's going to be a while before the care court thing really um, looms as the threat that it seems to be right now. That people are going to be still stumbling through, like how do we actually implement this? And and then even if we do, where are we going to keep these people? A lot of people I think are wait, trying to hold off for Prop One to pass because they want to get the institutions in place where they're going to put those people who are going to be running through care court. So I do think that, that that's not happening really, really fast. But in any case, more broadly, you know, I do see, um, I got to say that I'm actually feeling a little better overall. Like, I'm sorry about what's happening in California, but the reality is you're now getting where most of the other states already are. That's what's happening. You're, you've been closer to what the Supreme Court said should be happening around these issues than other states they've all, but and what's really unfortunate is there's billions of dollars in California to throw at it so I have little doubt that in the end this, you're going to be worse off than these other states who just don't have the finances to actually back up these abusive laws they've created they don't do a lot with them so yeah anyway I wanted to say on the positive side more positively there's definitely growing awareness out there. And I think the intersectional um, aspects of this are really important. We need to be liaising across different types of groups who are working on anti-carceriality, anti-racism, you know, anti-poverty, all, all these issues are totally related. And it's 10 years ago, I didn't see that. I, you know, People that were speaking out against involuntary commitment were largely isolated away from these groups. And now more and more of these groups are going, hey, we're all in this together and we're kind of battling the same things. And I think that's a tremendous development. I'm excited about it, frankly. You know, of course, it's a, the battle is huge. The battle is ahead is huge. But I'm like something like what's happening tonight that, you know, I think is great, you know, in that sense. And we need more of it. Uh, and that's what I'm feeling sort of positive about overall and everybody bringing their collective wisdom together to say, OK, if we see this as an intersectional problem and a fundamental problem around the organization of society and its prejudices and biases, then what's the way forward? It's not any one of these groups on their own. All right. That mostly covered all the Q and A. Uh, there are a couple I didn't get to. A lot of them were kind of overlapping, and so if I if we did miss anything, um, actually, if there's any other uh, questions that maybe we didn't answer, now would be the time. We are getting a little bit late here. We went pretty <laughs> we went pretty late, but this is good. It's important discussion. It's important information. Um, there are a lot of people with. Um, okay, Andre, Andrea. I think Hector yeah. put their hand up first and then oh Taylor. Hector yeah okay let me allow Hector to talk there we go Hector go for it 
I tell you, hey, siblings, this is so good to see you all in this space. Uh, definitely uh, having these conversations. I am starch struck as I look at my screen. Uh, but I think one of the things that really becomes apparent is that oftentimes that particular um, education component about our community and the collective work that we do um, is so important to continue. And I think if anything, uh, with Care Court and this, that has become apparent uh, is that that is something that we really do need to establish and each and every single one of you, I know personally, does this work in such incredible ways. Uh, and while we have, we stand on the shoulders of previous advocates like Sally, you are now our leaders, each and every single one. Our younger ones look to you in the way uh, that I, probably some of us looked at Sally. And so I think in the work that comes ahead after the ballot election, it's really important to develop those particular um, learning uh, collaborative partnerships. Uh, I was mentioning that Rob's book, uh, you know, your consent is not required. For me as a policy advocate, I use it both uh, to, as, a, as, as a tool to learn, but I, I used it also as one of the texts because it, it's just so comprehensive and really uh, encompassing of the issues, in, in, you know, that are uh, crucial to a community. So I think it's important to continue collecting that advocacy voice that we have, uh, diversifying it. I think if anything, after COVID and, and all the work that we have done, we realize that one of the reasons California leads the way in so many things is because of the advocacy work that we do. Uh, Mental health services side, you know, a lot of a lot of what the governor has funded came from advocacy. Uh, some of it, you know, not ours, obviously. Uh, but more than anything, I think that's an investment that I think both the counties need to have in their stakeholder programs, but then also the state. Um, and I think it wasn't a coincidence that we didn't necessarily have that coalition support and we were all kind of struggling to survive again during COVID. But I remember working before this measure of the challenges that we have. And you know, I think that for me is perhaps one of the biggest glaring goals out of this. Uh, having seen measures like this come back and just kind of seeing the writing on the wall at, at the state and federal level. So I think, you know, I really want to thank all of you for being here and educating us. Uh, I don't know everything none of us do because we're not privy to the information. And that's part of the disparities as we as people with disabilities. Uh, face and, you know, really unifying our psychiatric or, you know, mental health or SMI community into the disability community, uh, perhaps might be our biggest impacting uh, effort. California leads the nation of civil rights uh, in the disability community for a reason. And so, I, again, so thank you, Star Trek, Rob, you know, Latanya, Paul, and Kaleshi, you know, I'm really, really glad uh, that you're holding this space for our siblings. Thank you, Hector. It's very kind. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Hector. And Taylor. Um, can y'all hear me? We can. Okay. Um, first of all, what Hector said, yes. Um <laughs> also I um you know, Paul, I saw your reply to one of my questions in the chat. And so thank you. Um, I just wanted to also open that question up to everybody else and say, like, if anyone has sort of advice on where uh I should look to learn more about like the oversight issues that we've seen so far um, and also just the history of the MHSA and kind of like if there are failures that could maybe indicate um, how historically California has failed in this. Um, I'm trying to learn more about it. So please let me know who I should bug. Oh, geez. Oversight's such a huge thing. Uh, they're, they're claiming that the Prop 1's going to fix that. I have zero faith that it's going to. Um, when when Prop 6, 63 was, when Prop 63 was first created, it, it was, uh, there was an Oversight and Accountability Commission, MHSOAC, which was charged with, with a lot of that work. And um, they have not done a great job. Um, they, I mean, I think that, I think they're do, they're probably doing a better job than, than putting it into an overall umbrella, uh, MH or, um, the Department of Healthcare Services is going to do because they're not, at least they were specialized just in this particular, in this particular environment in terms of the, uh, um, 
MHSA. Um, but there have been failures for sure in the oversight. Uh, part of it was bottom line, they didn't do a great job. Part of it was that they were underfunded for to do some, they weren't funded to do the, some, some of the things that were expected of it. And that's of course in California and in a lot of the country, that's, um, that's endemic. Uh, legislators say, you gotta do this, you gotta do that, but they don't fund it well enough to actually do it properly. Uh, so I, I, give, I give negative kudos to both the OAC and to the, and to the state and the DHCS because actually the, the Department of Healthcare Services is getting this additional money. Um, they were given a, a horrible grade by the uh, state auditor on how they were involved with the oversight of the MHS OAC. Um, I really believe that the more control we have at the local level and the less meddling at the state level, we might be better off without an oversight and accountability commission um, or or uh, the uh, DHCS. I, I wouldn't want that because we need accountability and all the taxpayer money that we spend. But um, <clears throat> I just believe that real accountability happens at the local and individual level, not at the not 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 some you know somebody at DHCS in Sacramento running a spreadsheet to see what's happening. Um, mental health is more complicated than that. As I'd like to say, if you get 10 people coming into an emergency room with a broken leg, they're all handled the same way and you can measure that. But you get 10 people with men mental health crises coming in and you've got 10 different ways to, to uh, do it, so which makes accountability and that sort of thing really difficult. Rob, it looked like you were about to say something. Yeah, I just wanted to continue on really from what you're saying, Paul, on that is something I talk a lot about in the book, right? It's this problem of accountability and oversight. And, you know, a couple of things I do think it would be really easy to create better quality of life outcome measures for all mental health services, voluntary and involuntary, that we could be right more regularly monitoring. Like, do people get back on their feet? You know, do they get back to work if they were out of work? Do they get, are they no longer homeless if they were home? Things like that. And we aren't measuring that hardly anywhere and anywhere it has been measured. The mental health system fails and fails abysmally, generally speaking, right? So, so yeah, we need to measure it and find out what's working, what's not working more regularly. But the other thing is, I, you know, we got to highlight that I think you were just beginning to touch on that bit, a bit Paul, was, was there's this um, the problem here within the mental health system that that it is difficult to define, but that becomes a real problem with accountability too. That's why we need these quality of life measures because you can't really tell just by, well, somebody's symptoms apparently went up or down or something like this. That's not much of a measure to begin with, uh, let alone to end with. And, and it's so, so hard that even the Department of Justice highlighted to the, this to me, you know, in an interview on the record when I was saying, how do you catch the fraudsters? How do you catch the people who are literally just locking up anyone they want and, and abusively, you know, detaining them and drugging them? And they said, yeah, it's hard because it looks a lot like the good ones. Right. They didn't say it in those words, but that was the essence of it. Right. Where they admitted, even when we have an auditing team going into a facility, it's kind of hard to tell, you know, because blatant abuse of a person looks remarkably the same if you're doing it purely for profit or if you're doing it with supposed good intent. And we have to grapple with that as a society right now that, yeah, like if you're talking about outcomes for involuntary treatment and, and oversight of that, it, no, you can't. You really can't. You just, we got to get rid of involuntary treatment. It's just not something that you, that can possibly be, you know, safely done. Really, it's just a, it's like an oxymoron to say safe and good involuntary treatment. You know. Thank you all. That's super helpful. Thank you. Yeah, and I put and I and I put into the thing. It's the other aspect of mental health outcomes. It's. It, it's um, it's pretty easy to determine what would have happened if a cancer tumor hasn't been removed, but it's almost impossible to tell what would have happened without whatever intervention or treatment that you give. Um, you don't know what would have happened if they hadn't gotten that treatment, or if they didn't get it, you don't know really what would have happened if they had gotten it, because it's still an incredibly complex, the brain is by far the most complex organ in the body, and the mind is 10 times as complex as the brain. So. It's a it's a difficult measure, but as you say, you know the the uh, Rob the the outcome measurements that you're talking about are probably as close as we can get. 
<clears throat> is those those outcome measurements are are probably going to be the best way that we can do it until we know a heck of a lot more about the brain and the mind than we do now. Population control. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, on that note, um, <laughs> I think you have a like last slide with some resources. I know we're, I we're sure over, a bit over time and um, <laughs> we're going to close up, but are there any Paul, are there any last things around like resources we want to share with folks or um, the fact that people yeah, will get I, a recording of this at the end? I would, um, I currently sit on a DHCS um, Medi-Cal Managed Care Advisory Committee. And in May, our topic is going to be mental health. Um, I'm going to put my information um, in the chat because I'm trying to gather stuff that I can take to that committee. I have found them to be extremely responsive to the input that they're getting from members of the committee. Um, so it's DHCS, Medi-Cal Managed Care Advisory Committee. Um, and I'll put my... Um, I'll put my contact information in the in the in the chat. There it is. Okay. Thanks, Mary Jo. That's a great way to advocate, actually. So a lot of you all are calling for advocating, um, organizing. So please get on the California's against Prop One list. It sounds like we might probably need some future organizing, depending on what happens after March fifth. But yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll turn it over to Paul to, to get us out. Alrighty, so this is, uh, this is the information for the campaign, Info at Prop 1. Oh no. Is Paul frozen or did I freeze? Okay, Paul froze, okay. Paul froze. Oh, there Paul he froze. is. Can you see me now? Can you hear yeah. me? Okay, when I tried to share the screen, it, it ran into trouble, but I'll try it again here. Yeah, so um, these are the organizations that, that uh, actively came out against Prop 1. Uh, so there's quite a few of us. We're not just a few people, although we're a lot fewer than what the governor has access to. And these are different newspapers and such who have come out against Prop 1 as, as well. So there are a lot of, you know, we're not in this alone. Uh, reach out to your local media, reach out to your local organizations. And um, yeah, I think I'm going to stop that now. We, you will get, I know I flipped through those really quickly, but you, I, if you were here and logged in, you should get the slides in fairly short, fairly short order. So you'll be able to see all those uh, things. Thank you so much, Rob, especially for being here, uh, but all of you for being here. It's been so, it's been great. It's been, it's, it was a terrific discussion. I think that there are a lot of good questions, some of which we don't have answers to, but certainly, you know, I think we can begin to have answers with discussions and seminars like this, that we can begin to really find some better answers than are, than are being proposed at this time and tell everybody you know to vote no on Prop 1. <laughs> That's my final word. <laughs> Thank you.